Welcome everybody to the Christian Marauder. Today is going to be an interesting day because I'm kind of going to go off the cuff here. I'm going to talk about my book. And the reason why I wanted to talk about my book was that this last video that I did that came out last week and I posted it and people um, about the Antichrist and so forth, I had a comment on there that said, could you uh, tell us more about <laughs> what's in your book? I mean, tell us what, um, you had editors that edited your book. Yes, I did. And they took out some stuff. They took out and they wanted to know what things were the editors took out as well as other things that I did not put in the book. And um, most of you don't know that I wrote a book and I'll put, put it back on the screen again. It's called A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion. It is my book. I got a copy right here in front of me, right here, so it doesn't bleed out. I got to get in front of it, and um, so that's my book. And I wrote it more or less just as I, I'm more of an evangelist at heart, so I wanted to leave a testimony of what happened to me. I know people don't believe it and whatever, and I struggle with it. So, but it, you know, when you have an encounter. Uh, like mine, where you where you died and you, what happened to me, it leaves an impression upon you. And the impression that it leaves upon you is that, well, number one, uh, you owe your life to Jesus Christ because I know I do not deserve one iota to come back or be even here talking to you today. Um, it's only by His grace that I'm here. I know that. Also know that before I was saved, I was a wretch. People can testify that they know me in the past, and I did. I wasn't a very nice person. Just, just put it, put it nicely, and uh, had lots of problems. Things were driving me crazy. I was um, uh, wild, crazy, so to speak. Got involved in drugs and alcohol and all those things that everybody else talks about, and lived my life pretty rough. So I thought I write my book. And trying to explain it. So right after it happened, this happened, I wrote down on scraps of paper what happened. Because I couldn't believe it. And I wouldn't tell anybody about it because I was too afraid to. Because who's going to believe you that you died? Uh, you know, we live in this, this cynical world where you don't believe in spiritual things. And yet, I was an atheist at the time. And then all of a sudden, wow, I found out there is a spiritual side to life. And I was on the wrong side of the spiritual side of life, like most people are who don't realize it. Talk about some of those things. So I wrote my book more as or less as, as something that could lay on somebody's desk and they could find it later on. I didn't, you know, ha I didn't have too much expectation at first. You know, like everybody, oh, you know, I wish I could sell millions of copies. Well, that hasn't happened. You know, I don't sell a whole lot. I do sell some, and I, I thank God for that. That helps pay the bills. But, you know, but, you know, you, I just wanted to leave a, te a testimony of what happened despite what anybody says so that after I'm long gone, somebody can find this book and maybe get saved. That's all. Maybe they'll see. So what I did is I can put a bunch of events in my life, change names. I use a, what they know as composite character to convey life events that happened in my life. And so I put it in the appendix, what I did in my book. It's called Creative Nonfiction because the only way I could write it. But my first edition that I wrote down off of scraps of paper and stuff, I sent to... Uh, a couple people. One was my uh, a cousin in Arizona, and another was my mom, and uh, they compiled and helped me type out the first book, the draft. It was about 40 pages. It was boring, <laughs> and so I said, "There's no way I can publish a 40-page book." So I just set it on the side, and I and this this stuff really affects you when you have a life after death experience. You come back from a place that I saw, and you can't really talk about it because people don't want to hear it. So I talked to pastors. They told me to write a book. So before I wrote the book in 19, I can't remember the year, probably 87 or 86, I was at a church, a large uh, church here in Loveland, Colorado. And so a very good church too at that time. And I was asked to give my testimony because I talked to the pastor. He said, you, 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 why don't you give your testimony tonight? So 
Okay, I went there, like 2,000 people, and he, he told me, you only have 10 minutes. If you can't do it in 10 minutes, you know, you know he, was, he was testing me. You know, he, 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 was, he was a mentor. I mean, he was somebody who pushed you and, and, and refined your character and helped me immensely. And he was, he, he was tough but it had to be for somebody like me. So anyway, so I, I took 15 minutes, at least 14 or 15. He didn't care because we had, you know, he, I think 34 some odd people, maybe more came up and got saved that night. It, it, was, it was a phenomenal thing. And I was hooked. I said, wow, uh, I did my testimony in, in 10 minutes and boom, all these people came up. And uh, so that's how I started talking about it. So didn't have a book, so they told me to write a book. So much later in life, things happened. I debated it, kind of worked on it, and then put it aside, talked to people about it, and decided just to go ahead and write it. So I wrote it, uh, 2003 to 4, off my old notes, as in the old 40-page uh, thing. And I said, I was, I was praying, I go, how in the world do I write this book? How can I even explain the spiritual stuff that I saw and felt? Well, you know, how? And it just came to me, uh, I came across something kind of out of the blue called creative nonfiction. So I investigated it, and this is what I felt I should do. It was, I can't tell people's names, and I don't want to reveal their names. So I did composite characters of, and in and, and, and different places, different times, and different locations, and combine them into one like events so you can get a, an idea how I was back then and everything everything in there is true <laughs> when I moved out to Tucson Arizona all that's true however some of those events were in other road trips <laughs> I just kind of combined them you know so uh, so you, and, and on the trip out there but there there West Texas is uh, West Texas, and these little towns out there, you pull up, and the dusty road, and dust, all, oh man, I'm telling you, I took all that from um, our trip out there to move to Tucson, Arizona, where I drank bad water by accident in a construction site, contracted waterborne disease, found out later I had some other stuff with it, because I found just recently something I wrote shortly afterwards, and uh, my hospital records I lost. I mean, I'm trying to find them. I don't know what happened to them. And I wrote to the hospital to get my records. And they said that um, those records are on microfish and whatever. It would cost a heck of a lot of money to find them. And then they no guarantee that they would find them because a lot of those records back in those days, almost 40 years later, are probably gone. Um, so... You know, uh, so that that's that was a thing, and so I did find something I wrote afterwards, and I had um, I had cholera, something I think it was called um, shingilla, and uh, some type of dysentery, all rolled into one, and who knows what else. In other words, and there's enough stuff to kill you, <laughs> which it did. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk too much about my actual testimony. I want to talk about the book. Because in the book, when I was editing it, the uh, many people and editors I had, I had like three editors, uh, which is fine. I had to pay for them, kind of expensive, but I, different parts of the book. And then I went over to the uh, self-published because I couldn't find a publisher. And um, so uh, I self-published. And then the, and they ended up publishing the unedited version of my book. And I got mad. I go, what are you doing? And they went back and corrected it. So there is a, 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 a unedited version of my book out there. It's probably pretty rare. Uh, I don't know how many copies were sold. Not very many, thankfully. But it was the unedited copy. <laughs> you know, and I go, what are you people doing over at Salem? Why in the world did you do that? Well, they corrected it. They were, they were good enough to do that and get the edited version out there. So editors lopped out some things because they were redundant. And... Others were kind of difficult to understand because, you know, which it is. And, and one of the things they edited out, and I'll be up front with you, was the language. Because in the original language of this was, uh, you know, I wrote what the demon said. I mean, every cuss word. And I grew up in, a, in the East Coast, in the 
south of D.C. area in the Falls Church area. And um, at least where I was, every other word was a cuss word. I mean, you, you, you cuss. I mean, you, normal talk was cussing. We, we were not as bad as New Yorkers. <laughs> and a little bit better than what they are like in Boston, okay? <laughs> but every other word is a swear word. And so that's, you know, so I was out with my friends and my buddies that we just, that's how we talked. So I couldn't convey that language and I couldn't convey what the, the, the demonic world and how they speak. So I had to write it differently. So that was taken out of the book and I'm not going to discuss that, nor will I say that those words on air. So other things were edited out. So that's what I want to talk about today for you people that are interested in this so this is all off the cuff i'm not and if i do show this anywhere else it's not going to have any pictures or videos or nothing like that in it it's just going to be a straight video if i post it someplace else so just be beware of that some people always ask you know oh, i don't believe you had an after death experience because you know once you die you come under judgment and i would say yeah most certainly you do you, you you stand before the lord god almighty and you are in judge and that is that judgment is actually more frightening than seeing hell it really is because your real you is exposed what you really like on the inside is exposed and uh, you don't you don't have any excuses and you put place an awkward spot and then another thing i kept getting is why all these positive positive uh, after death experiences you know i've seen uh, when i when i wrote my book i got in contact or they contacted me i don't know some major people who investigate this stuff and and their one website I was kind of you know talking to them and I realized wow this is this is different you know who and I was talking to him and so this guy had an after-death experience as a kid kind of explain this he went to heaven which I totally believe I don't have a doubt to believe that because you know, it's just the way you know that Jesus said it you know I forbid not the little children to come unto me. Whoever forbids a child or does harm to a child will be better than the millstone tied around his neck. I don't think God's going to tie a millstone around his neck and throw himself into the sea by uh, condemning infants and little teeny kids into hell. I really don't. Be contrary to his word. There's a, there's a, there's a sense of uh, little kids, you know, your parent, you know, the little kids do toddlers and, and, and three-year-old kindergartners up to sixth grade. They're easily swayed by adults and bullied into things that very easy for them to do that. That's why we got to protect our kids from the new bullies that are out there trying to push an agenda and implement medical procedures that the kids will later regret doing once they get some moral reasoning. We got to protect our kids, folks. Now, how do I get off of that rabbit trail? I don't know. So let's get back to the guy I was talking about. So I was talking to him and another guy, too. But this particular guy was really interesting. He's very nice, actually. So we conversed for a while over the Internet. And he uh, had an after-death experience. He died as a kid, saw underwater for like 25 minutes, got up. And they got him out of the water, ice cold water. He came back to life, amazingly. And so uh, as the years passed... He became more of a new ager, so his near-death sight that he had was more new age stuff. And I'm going, wow. So I got introduced to all these people who had these other experiences. And I think one of the reasons why the Lord had me write this book was that I explained how it was with me, as well as another person I saw who I called Dear Pudding in the book. Uh, you, you don't know how deceptive the demonic world is. You really don't unless you actually seen a place like I saw. You do not understand deception. So a lot of people have after-death experiences, and you got to understand that hell has layers of um, recompense, okay? It's, it's, it's called payback, and the recompense. Some people will come in a, a higher level of this pit and have a little less than someone below, but it's all deceptive because... The people that are above on these levels of this pit are going to be slowly moving down to the lower levels. I'll explain why in a little bit. And so, 
So you get these people come in there and they, they think they are entered into paradise right away. Oh boy, I'm in paradise. There's love here. There's all kinds of things. I thought that when I first entered this place. For a second, I didn't know why I was apprehensive, but I did not know what I entered into. And then all of a sudden, it was real to me. And so I wrote about this also about a woman who was named, I call Veer Pudding, died in a car wreck, came down, and she thought she was at her grandparents' farm, and met her relatives, all the stuff, and everything's wonderful, until a little bit later. And so, so one of the reasons I wrote this book was to tr- not to try to disparage other people's after-death experience, but try to make them think that maybe you just were not in a very good place, but did not or were not dead long enough to find out where you were. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's, it's quite possible. And so they come back with deception. That's all I can say. You can believe me or you don't have to. I will answer you this. All these people say, oh, no, thousands and millions of people say they, are, they go to they die and they go to heaven and everything's wonderful. Go to the light, go to the light. It's all going to be wonderful. And all these hell experiences are just lies or, you know, blah, blah, blah. they have reasons for that. But I want to tell you something. If it sounds too good to be true, then it is. And all these positive near-death experiences or after-death experiences are, uh, if it sounds too good to be true, then it is. You know, you deal, you know, you deal with used car salesmen, they make it sound too good to be true. Then you buy the car and it's a piece of junk. That's kind of, uh, that's deception. And I want to talk about some things that happened to me there that um, I did not put in the book as well as uh, what was taken out of the book. So first off, you know, I stood before Jesus and he spoke to me that I would see a land unknown that's best forgotten but not to be, not to be, not to be remain unseen. That's something. And and when I arrive at this place, say his name and his title. I'm just paraphrasing from one of the pages. I wrote this stuff down afterwards, and that's what he, I, that stuck in my mind. It's still there. And and he told me that basically it would be an appointed time when this will come out. So I said, okay. I had no idea what any of this meant, meant when I was at the time. I was uh, I was flummoxed. I was like deer in the headlight. Look, I did not comprehend what was going on. I, I wanted to wake up and all this stuff, and I couldn't. And so I was shown the, the abyss. It's real. And so these are some of the things. I'm not going to talk about, you know, all the stuff but that's in the book. I'm going to talk about things that are not in the book. But in some things that are in the book. So it's some things that are in the book is how I got there. And I got this place. I thought I was in paradise. You know, all these entities came up to me. I thought there were people. Then they turned into what they really were. And they started to attack me. That was my first inkling of what deception was like. And, and Jesus gave me permission to say his name and his title. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. When I said that, uh, they, they uh, couldn't grab me, poke me, or take me down. Because I had permission to say it. And as a born-again believer, you have permission to say that name. And every knee will bow and tongue confess. You do not know the power of the name of Jesus in, in, in anything. You don't know the, the by faith or applying the blood of Christ that reminds the demonic world. They put Jesus on the cross. They uh, made a pu- and, and Christ Jesus made a public spectacle over them. And he judged them and stripped them of their power. So they don't have absolute control over you. Now, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. That's through the deception, which I'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, I'm trying to give you an understanding what deception is. Anyway, so I went through there, and I began seeing uh, all this stuff. And this entity came to me, and I call him Lizard Breath. (laughs) There's a statue of him in the... um, in a sculpture garden in Loveland. Interesting, you know, I didn't, you know, they put that thing up in the early 2000 or mid-2000, 2007 or six or something. And all these years later, I walked by and there's this thing. Oh, so, you know, it was this little lizard creature I call Lizard Breath. And he took me on a um, little tour of the place. 
I hated my guts. And um, <laughs> I called him lizard breath because his breath was so foul it distorted his face. And so he, he, I mean, his, he was deceptive, just put it that way. And so we ended up, yeah, you know, you stuck us um, just basically uh, kind of to just do this set the stage. And like I said in my book, we're in. Uh, I was I, I was actually in a cube, a little cell. I didn't know it. So he walked over to the wall of this cell, which looked like the horizon to me. Stuck his hand in, ripped it open, and there we he stepped out, motioned for me to come, and I turned around and looked, and I was inside of a cube, a cell, a chamber of death, as the Bible would call it. Everything that happened to me is in the Bible. When I got back and I got saved and start investigating the Bible and studying it, I kept coming across things. This is what I saw. The Bible was the only book that had the answers to what I saw, described what I saw. Everything I was in it was and saw was in is in the Bible. In different places that you might not, not, not even think, like Ezekiel chapter 32, where it talks about a pit of hell. I was in a pit of hell. It's shaped like a spiral staircase. The... Um, Stairs would be the, what do you call it, uh, this wide, dusty road and spiral up and down, and the walls were the cells, and there was a wide expanse there, and in the middle was a donut hole shape like a spiral staircase, best way I can put it. And so that was the pit. And it talks about, in Ezekiel 32, the pit being roundabout, uh, people being embedded into the walls, the cells, in the walls. It talks about that in the Hebrew language, and uh, it's in there. It's in there. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. And there are other things that I saw, too. We'll talk about some of those. So, and so I saw in this very horrible place, very hot, very, you know, everything like that. And so when I wrote my book, there were things in there that were left out because uh, one of the editors, and they, all three of them said some things were just too redundant, take them out. So what was the redundant part? Well, when I walked around, I saw these chambers of death and people inside of these, these, these cubes living in their own uh, world, so to speak, that they lived in, in, where they, in the era and time where they were. It was like It would be equivalent to what the holodeck is in Star Trek Next Generation. It's very small, 10 by 10 or 14 by 14, something like that would be the dimensions. And they would think they're in the all outdoors or wherever. But many of the people were in little teeny holes. I uh, can't explain it. They were wedged into holes and they couldn't move. And so I kept explaining people were buried uh, neck up to their neck and stuff. I only have one person in the book that, uh, that was in there. But there are so many people like that. A lot of these people were, um, uh, who did this were soldiers ancient soldiers, and these were the forms of, of torment they did and, and buried people or rolled people up in, um, what do you call it? Uh, it was like tar and hay or something and wrapped the people up in it and put them in this shallow pit and lit them on fire. And so they were experiencing the same thing. All that got edited out because I saw a lot of that. And oddly, Ezekiel chapter 32 talks about soldiers <laughs> in their place in the abyss, so who did atrocities, ancient atrocities. And so I, I was actually seeing some of that. So some of that got, got left out of the book because it was too redundant. And so what, a, what you sow is what you reap. And that brings us another question, which I'll try to answer in just, in just a bit and tell you what the question is. But that was one of the things that got edited out of the book. Uh, other things got edited out of the book. I am writing another book. It's, and it's on heaven. Heaven beckons. I think that might be the title or the destin, destination of heaven or something like that. Might be. I'm deciding on a title, waiting for the publisher, trying to get the contract. I want to ask some questions about the contract. And I want to get this, this book popped out. But in the new book on heaven, I describe something that I saw in hell that I'm going to share here. And I won't go into too much detail, but what this was that's not in the book that was going to be in the first book, but it was taken out. And I decided to remove it because it just I didn't know where to place it. And this was... Um, they, this entity always say that they were in the Grand Palace. So, and so forth, etc. But in this one particular building there, there was a, uh, all these rooms. And 
And it's the most creepiest place I've ever seen or experienced in my life. And the we came to a room, and I had no idea what in the world I was looking at and, and smelling. The place smelled horrible as, as it is, but this was really uh, horrible. So I went up there, and there was this a big vat. looked like a bowl, but a big vat. It had black goo with silver laced through it. And it smelled horrible, and it was a... It was a filthy mire, and what came out of it was ambiances of, well, I'm going to get the Bible and tell you what it reeked of, the only best way I can put it, and uh, I might have to get my Bible software, so I'll light up my face here for a second and type this in, yeah, there it is, Galatians. So this is, this is what it reeked out of. Adultery, fornification, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That was what's coming out of it. And those are just mere intellectual words to most of you people out there and me at one time. But you have no idea what uh, uh, that is, you know, what the smell of dissension is and uh, what I was seeing or, or experiencing. You know why I kind of left it out because there's no way I could explain this um, or what heresy that I was seeing bubbled out I, I, or, or jealousy, what I was seeing in, in that. And, and it was... It was filth and it was like this was seeping up out of the abyss somehow and influencing people that I mean that this is the normal way you have to act to be cool to be you okay and this is all the stuff was it was like the vapors that coming off of it were totally deceptive we're going to look at this again You know, people don't know what adultery is. They don't really know what sorcery is. They really don't know what licentiousness is or fortification or uncleanness is. They really don't. They really don't. Because this is all uh, conjured out of there to make it look like it's normal. How does it? And that's what I was seeing. That's why I couldn't really convey it because I couldn't find the words to convey what this big bubbling black and silvery goo. The silver kind of represent, this is cool. This is the way to be. This is the new normal. But the black filth was filth. I do not know why this was a big bat down there, why it was bubbling a little bit. Not bubbling like real, it was like popping. If you've ever been to... Uh, uh, Yellowstone, and you see these mud pots, not where they're really bubbling, but once in a while they pop up. That's kind of what it was doing. And the smell up there was this of this place was horrible. And that's it was like a, it was like a bowl or a vat of, of absolute stinking filth. And I'll say this right out. I do not think this is related to the book of Revelations or the cup of, of filth that the, the harlot was carrying. I do not think this is of that because nobody was carrying this. It's just there. It is just the stuff, and um, and so I left there, and you know it always puzzled me. So I wrote a little bit about it in as in a flashback form in my new book, but I still can't convey everything. So what is dissension? What is revelry? What is licentious? What is all this stuff? What is what exactly is it? Well, one is trying to make to, to make you think that you are living a normal life. Okay, it's selling you something. Okay, now I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> um, all these people are out there, and this is totally, I'm going to use this. That's a, a, a series that was an Amazon Prime. And there are eight episodes have just been shown. And the eighth episode was shown this Friday. And you have all these detractors saying that this episode, these are these is this is bad, this is horrible, or whatever. And, and but it's actually an excellent series. If you like the Lord of the Rings, it's the uh, it's the Rings of Power. Some of you might hate it. I'm sorry, but I'm just saying. I thought it was very good. I can't find what all the detractors are. It's a book about J.R.R. Tolkien called the Similarian or Similarius. 
I bought that book when I was younger. I still have it. It, it to me, it was Tolkien was writing a, a three-part trilogy on the history of Middle Earth and how it all came. So he wrote. 20 or 30 or 40 pages a piece on that and he would later build off that but I think he passed away or something I don't know why yeah, I think he passed away and so they got the last section was about 20 or 30 pages called the rings of power so that's what the series is but they kind of blend the other parts to it and they mix things in there that's I guess what people don't like well they did it you know it's just Hollywood stuff but it's a pretty good series but in the eighth episode Deception is totally revealed in the most unique way. It, it just it gave me the creeps. I go, wow, that conveys what this stuff bubbled up as. So let me back up and try to describe it. There's this character called Halibran. And then there's Gadriel, you know. And she was trying to hunt down Saram, Sar, Sar, Saran. And Saron. And um, so... She did not realize that Halibran, this man who rescued her from the sea, was Saron. <laughs> In the book, the Similarian, Saron was a would be a, not exactly a shapeshifter, but he would be he would be an enchanter. So Tolkien must have used this as a play on an enchanter, or uh, Lucifer, or. Or, or one of the devil's minions, or maybe the devil himself. It's not un, not real clear what he did here. I, I know that he was using the old gods um, thing to write the book, which I understand. But uh, <laughs> so at this episode, he um, at the end of the eighth episode, what he was doing. Uh, this is how evil works. Okay, it's, this showed it so perfectly how it manipulates people. So. He, he got on the good side of Gadriel, got to uh, where they were going to, um, there was something entered into the atmosphere that was causing the elf kingdom to die. And if they didn't get this substance called mithril, mithril um, which the dwarves, dwarves denied them, so, so to speak, they only had a little bit. And so how could they save themselves from uh, extinction or having to, to leave Middle Earth? Okay. So they would, so Halibran comes up there because he's a smith, and he's talking to the head elfin smith there, and I can't pronounce his name, Claraborn or something, and he said, all you have to do is mix the metal with another substance, and they tried, it didn't work, he said, just, it might just blend it with something else, and then he saw Gadriel get a scroll who had information that Halibran never existed, there is no king of the south, okay? And so she went down there, was reading it, and suddenly he was there, and he was talking to her. And this is where, this is deception. He revealed himself to her as Saron, and then an enchanter, and he appeared as her brother, and he says, I'm going to reshape and remake Middle Earth into a beautiful utopia. Just follow me, and you will be the queen. Okay, and she resisted and all that, and he took off. And next scene, you see him near the end of the show. He's walking in the land of mortar and destruction. The land they want to produce is destruction. The devils of hell want to produce destruction, but in the meantime, they're doing this. Man, I'm telling you, oh, um, you know, idolatry is is, is, is beautiful. I'm building a new world, a new world. We're going to build it back better. We're going to do it with sorcery. You can get into sorcery because you're doing it for noble purposes. Adultery, it's, it, you, know, you, you know, you marry that woman and she don't carry her, that man, you know, go with that one. Who cares? It's better over here. It's a brave and better world for you to be jealous. They got something, you know, that, that you don't have, and, and you deserve it because you want to build your better world. Okay, um, fornification, all types of sexual immorality. You know, go ahead, let the little kids go to California and get their private parts locked off. 
and chemically castrated because they they need to because we're building a brave new world. How dare you? How dare you say they can't do it? Well, little kids can't make up their mind. Oh, no, you are the oppressor. We're doing this for their benefit. It's a brave new world. That was bubbling out of that cauldron. And that's why I left that out of the book. How in the world can I explain that until I saw <laughs> this trilogy of the Lord of the Rings on episode 8 of the Rings of Power? And I go, that is how they deceive. And they do it in the church world. And they deceive in pastors and ministers to go woke. Man, I that. Outburst of wrath. Wow, it's a brave new world. You're justified to go after, you know, those evil Christians who want to repress everybody because you're doing this for a noble cause, a more fair and equitable world. But they don't realize you're going to produce a hellhole on earth in these areas. The other thing I saw when I come back and I never really was able to talk about, and yeah, I have in different ways, is... is is some of the insights I got from this experience was how the devil talks to Eve and how, you know, we'd read it, you know, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and so forth, etc. She saw it was, um, I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 3 here. And, and, and when Eve, or the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree is desirable to make her wise, she took of its fruit and ate and gave to her husband. He ate because he was just standing right there. Uh, just as guilty as she is, probably more so because he allowed her and he blamed her. And this is deception. Because the tree of knowledge and good and evil is, 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 is how to work good and evil to get out of a jam. I taught on this extensively for years. And that's what this is doing. That's what deception does. So how all this bowl of filth and all that stuff works in this plane, I do not know, but all I know is I see it happen. And so people are totally deceived about it. But in the name of Jesus Christ, once it's revealed in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus exposes it in the name of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus, he breaks, breaks its power. So you don't, ha you, you don't have to be held captive of that anymore. You can walk free of it. And the reason why we are... Um, uh, are kind of can't seem to be free of it because we got wombs in our heart. Things tortured us as we were kids and wounded us, broke our hearts and crushed our spirits, okay, when we were little. Maybe you didn't have parents. Maybe you had one parent. Maybe you had abusive parents. Maybe your parent, parents were psychopathic. Maybe they were crazy. I don't know. Maybe you grew up abandoned, kicked on the side of the road. Maybe you were in a war and you saw mass killings. I mean, you watch your family die. Things like that affect you, okay? So another scene in episode 8 of the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, the, not the Lord of the Rings but the, the Rings of Power <laughs> was that they called him Meteor Man. I'm trying to figure out who in the heck is Meteor Man. I thought this has got to be Gandalf. You know, it's got this, you know, you know it's totally outside of the book but it, I kept thinking this is probably Gandalf. So there's these three entities these spiritual entities and I can't remember the name of or what Tolkien called them in the Sumer Sumerian but they're a very evil things <laughs> and they look very transish you know very um androgynous they're very androgynous beings that's probably why people don't like and talking bad about the series and these are very evil beings and they came up and they found meteor man or whatever and they were uh, trying to convince him that he was seron trying to flip him over to the dark side they were attacking him and then the, uh, let's see, Brandy took, or just say the Heartfoots, which would be hobbits, <laughs> saved him. Okay? So he was being tortured until we go to the dark side. 
So guess what? A lot of people do when they grow up. I want you to think how deception works. This is what I saw, and this is not in the book because I couldn't put it in the book until today. I mean, until I can just tell you. That's how deception works. It tortures you. You were robbed, killed, and destroyed in your life. You were held captive under the sway of the evil one until you convert to think filth. You were abandoned, you were neglected, you were molested until you run your life from one failed relationship to another. You do drinks, you, you're in pornography, you're doing this stuff, and then your soul has paradise and escapes all the pain and it's a wonderful world, but it's miserable for you. And that is something I could not convey and put in my book. Because <laughs> I didn't know how. And, you know, and I teach and I taught on this stuff from the <laughs> mid-1980s when I was out on the street. Uh, I went up to the reservations. I, I've gone all over the place. I mean, I've taught parts of this. But now I have something, an objective lesson that I can tell you about in all things, a prime video uh, series called The Rings of Power, Episode 8, which brings it out what deception really is and how it works. And this is why uh, I'm going to go to this verse. It's so important why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. When you get born again, the Holy Spirit's in us. He sets us free. It's a process. Get the junk out of the trunk sometimes. You know, it hurts to, to realize that you've been bamboozled. There's grief and grief in what this world's really like. And it's not the utopia that, that we all think. And he sent forth the Holy Spirit to indwell in us. But Jesus quoted these verses in, in Matthew, cha no, Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter, I can't remember the chapter, but it's Luke chapter 4. But he's quoting Isaiah 61. These, this was my call to ministry scripture. I had two call to ministry scriptures, this one and the book of James, where it says, do not desire to be teachers because you'll be held under a stricter judgment. Those were the two. I said yes to both. So this, and it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor and he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. When you got born again, do you realize the Holy Spirit is upon you? What? what he has anointed us, what? To preach good tidings or good news to the poor means crushed in spirit. Torture to go to the dark side, to comply with it. Okay? He sent me to heal the brokenhearted who are crushed and hearts shattered to walk in the deception of the dark side. Okay? Proclaim liberty to the captives, those held captive to repeating cycles of sin, whatever. Lifestyle, choices to get you, to torture you, to comply to the dark side, okay? Opening the prison to those who are bound, bound to live in the dark side. They think this stuff is cool, this is the way to be. They're so minded, this cup of filth is so wonderful, and this is the new way, they're going to build it back better. They don't know the hell they're creating on earth. Jesus was quoting from the Septuagint, and there's another thing. The Septuagint adds a verse in there to open the eyes of the blind, which is found in another place in Isaiah as, as well. And so or he was quoting Isaiah and inserted that in there because that's part of it. Open your spiritual eyes so you're no longer blind to the wiles and to the vices of the evil one who wants to torture you until you comply. We see this in the world of politics today. We see it happening with uh, food shortages. We're seeing it happen in Europe right now. Think about what deception is and what's going on. And to proclaim the year of the, the acceptable year of the Lord. This is talking about salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Okay? And the day of vengeance over God. There's going to be a day of vengeance and recompense come. You're not going to get off the hook. Okay, if you remain on the dark side, thinking this stuff is cool, adultery and having sex with anything that walks or moves is, is, is the way to be, uh, there comes a reckoning. And Jesus paid the price to ransom you so you can get out of that mess, and he restores to, you, to, you, to us what it means to be human again. 
to be created in the image and likeness of God, which actually means we're to govern our world according to his love, joy, peace, the fruit of the Spirit. Total opposite of this. And, and we'll see the same principle in Galatians here in just a second, chapter 5. And so, and, and so it goes, and to comfort all who mourn, and console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the plantings of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins and shall raise up former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations that many generations have wrought. In other words, uh, this is going to be fulfilled in... Uh, Revelations chapter 22 and 21, 21, about a new heavens and earth. But, but we're in this fallen world, in this deception, in this filth. I'm going to go back to the book of Galatians here so you understand what I'm saying. I say, and walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That's, that's the way it is. This is, is a conflict. Even I fight it off. We, we do. But as you get older and you understand the deception and you start, you know, knowing that he's setting you free, this you start walking by the Spirit. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, suffering, long-suffering, long or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The dark side wants to control you, control your thoughts. No free speech allowed. God allows free speech. He wants you to make your own decisions. The dark side wants to torture you until you make their decisions. And that's kind of what I saw in the, in, in, in the, in the pit of hell that I could not write. <laughs> I couldn't convey it, right? Even though I tried to teach on it for years, what this is in different ways. And then now I have something, objective lesson. I can see how deceptive, uh, what deception is and what it means. When they see the... Um, the Rings of Power, the eighth episode, when Halibran is revealed as Seron, and how he's trying to seduce Gadriel to be the queen of the dark side by promising a brave new world. Then you see those other three demonic entities that I can't, I can't remember the names of them right off the bat, but they were the dark side, which uh, they're spiritual beings, and they were torturing Gandalf, or the meteor man who it is Gandalf, and uh, I'm sure of it. Some people think he's a bar log. I won't get into that, but no, it's got to be Gandalf. And and so um, and you're spared by the hobbits. Now you can see this connection with him and the hobbits and how that came about. Is that in the book? Probably not. People get mad. I don't care. But it does show you how evil tortures you, forces you to comply, to think. That jealousy, envy, wrath, fornication is norm. It's a way to build back better, join the dark side. And your life's a living hell. Jesus came to set you free from that, restore to you what it means to be human by living by love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, self-control. It's a lifelong process where none of us are going to reach the end of it until we die, but we sure can be free of this stuff one sin at a time one day at a time, and we're going to present that message to, to, to folks. So that was just one of the big things that was not written in the book because I left out because I did not know how to convey it <laughs> until today. <laughs> um, so another thing, other things I left out of the book were um, scenes that were too graphic to, to write because I saw so much. And... I, I, I talked about these rooms, I you know, uh, we kind of walk between the two cubes and they pull the side of you and the um, texture of these cells, <clears throat> walls to me felt like. Years later, I was in SeaWorld <coughs> in California and there were a dolphin tank, so I started petting a dolphin. Excuse me, I had to sneeze. I pet a dolphin, and the walls of this thing felt like how a dolphin's skin feel was alive. It was, it was a weird feeling. 
no disparagement to dolphins. But and so I remember that stuff rubbing against my skin as I walked between these cubes and looking at people because I could see them inside. A lot of what I saw was left out. I put some of it in there. And there'd be clips of like a sign waiting for somebody to arrive. Your name's in hell, you know, whatever. And uh, it's, it's not, you know, waiting reserved for so-and-so. That doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but to me it does because there are some people no matter what they're just they're not they're not going to change and um they're sold out we don't know who they are but you know some of them are pretty bad people but anyway then i walked through there and other people in various stages of torment a lot of people have uh, would you know they would be pretty despondent some of their cells were pretty bleak there's nothing inside of them just kind of dark, maybe it looked like up here like a window. And all they could do is sit there. All they're doing is sitting there. And I uh, saw so a lot of that. That kind of stuff got edited out of the book because there were a lot of people in different cells, different rooms, that nothing was really going on. They were just bored out of their heads, bored out of their skull. We moved on. And then we came to these, you know, it's like how a bricklayer... Um, I don't know how you do this, but you got a brick layer. You know, you got a brick layer, you have uh, two walls, but when you make a concave circle, it, it makes a little V-shaped room. As you go further back, the, how the bricks are shaped, the rooms get a little bigger. So I was writing about that and walking through these things with all these entities in them, grabbing and trying to bring me down, cursing at me and all this stuff. But, uh, so I, I did explain that in the book, and we, but uh, I couldn't really capture or express the fear or the deception they were emanating to try to get you to curse God, curse them, curse yourself. And all I could say was, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the only thing I could keep my sanity, because if I were to listen to them, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. And so I was walking amongst all these things, and that kind of leaves an impression to you. And this leads me to another part that's not in the book, but it is my disdain for the occult world and my disdain for the deception it causes people involved in Luciferianism or the deception of Satanism or devil worship, Witkins, so forth. I have a disdain for their works, not for so much for the people, but for the works, because I see that they are deceived. They're thinking that they're going to produce utopia on earth. They're sold out for it, but they can't see themselves as Halibran walking in a desolate waste, thinking that's the new way to be, because that's what the devil wants. He wants to destroy, kill, rob, and destroy the entire world. Now, I have a green screen behind me, and a uh, nice mountainous area. I don't know where it's at. It's just there somewhere. Whoever owned this house is a pretty nice place. And um, imagine all that burnt to a crisp. It's volcanoes and smoke blowing around. That's the world the devil wants. Total destruction. <clears throat> Living in your mind thinking that's the place to be because it's cool to live there. So... That's, uh, you know, the thing I saw the most is the deception and how people are deceived to think that doing these things are the way to go. So when I was walking through this place, that was being conveyed at me constantly. And so we went through other things. I, I know I went through there and I saw these people and, and um, I mean, so there's just thousands of people I walked by. And I can't put every single person in the book it would be too, too much. So I just put what I what struck me as the most that I remember the most. The others kind of get blurred. But you come to some, um, lots of people who believe in, uh, uh, be, I'll be nice, false religions instead of naming every single religion. False religious systems, how they were duped and believing they were following these gods, and they, and they would enter into their cells and meet their so-called gods who weren't gods, and they, then it was revealed to them what they were, like the elephant thing in Hinduism, or Shiva, or whatever, or the purple being. And 
and all these other things that were there. But anyway, those are the type of things I saw there. And, and so some of the people I saw were in various degrees of torment uh, that I can't write about or discuss because it's too gross. Someone should go, why, why, why do they deserve this? Well, everybody doesn't think they deserve it because they've been deceived to think that jealousy, envy, and, and, and everything is justified because to make a brave, brave new world for them, give them enough drugs. I mean, I, I, I went by uh, going to the store up here in Fort Collins, went by an area here, by an area up here, all the tents were there, all the people there, and all these, and I'm going, boy, these, these people are probably 18 to 25 years old. What are they doing there? Why are they living on the street like this? All these things have jobs out there. And, you know, it would be nice if someone could hear my voice. It would be a nice organization where these people could go to and make a phone call and have um, messages given and they can check themselves if they're serious and get a job and they can have a place where, where they can make contact, a place where they get cleaned up and go to a job interview. And, and if they get a job, these people could help them get their feet established. Maybe something like that. Somebody could grab a hold of that and do something for them. But I was thinking of that. No, these people are, most of them would not. I think when they get about 60 years old, what are they going to do? What are they going to do in a medical emergency? So, um, why are they doing this? Deception. Who knows all the reasons? Some of it could be illness, mil mental illness, but I don't think so. I think it's just uh, just the way, the way of the world's gone. Teaching them and brainwashing them, enchanting them. Why work? Get it all free. This is cool. They have lots of friends there on the street. It's a whole system of, 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 you know, you might slit your throat, but, you know, but at least you have some friends. Yeah. And they were deceived, broken families, homes, so forth, etc. I see all that. So. So you just see all this stuff, how people have been enchanted who live in darkness. And that's kind of what I saw mostly in hell, okay? People enchanted. And they go down there, and they can't use that as an excuse because they bought it hook, line, and sinker. This was their way of life. And what God will show them over and over again, will show them dreams they had to warn them to change their way, You'll show them Christians who came to, to witness to them. You'll show them nature itself, that he's the creator, and uh, you destroyed my natural order. I'm not talking about destroying the planet. I'm talking about destroying with your lifestyle choices, altering yourself, and doing these crazy things to yourself. He'll show you that. He says... I made things. I designed you to live by love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, mercy, truth, you know, walk by truth, all these things, and you threw it away. And the Lord Jesus Christ is all about making us, giving us our humanity back, and the devil's about stripping it away from us and destroying us so we do live in tents. So we do live in, in, in pig slop, I'm thinking this is the way to live. And that's all there is. So, that's one of the big things that I did not put in my book because I did not know how to convey it too accurately, though I've been trying to preach it for years. So, other things I saw in hell. Let's see before I try to wrap this up. Yeah, there's a place that I saw. It was a, uh, an area. It was on the sixth row high of these cubes. you got to read my book, Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, to know what I'm talking about. But... And all the tops of the cells were open, and all these people were in holes. And these entities were pushing these people back in or, or mocking them, so they crawl back in the hole and basically die and then come back to life and so forth, etc. They didn't die. They were, you know, I saw people uh, flesh rot off their bones, and uh, 
then come back on over and over again, being eaten by these uh, moths with teeth and these worms with teeth, and then come back, have it happen again. These are some vile people who live their life in a narcissistic way, eat the heart out of people, destroy people's lives. Now they're living in their own mire, their own filth in some hole in hell for eternity. That's the things I saw. I saw a lot of that. that was a, and that was one of the things that got edited out of the book because I saw so much of it. <laughs> Other people have seen hell, have seen the same thing. I mean, they've seen the same place. I mean, the same place I'm describing. And other entities would have clubs and smack them back down into holes I, I, you know and it's, it's an amazing thing and just seeing stuff like this does affect you and um, so one last thing I want to talk about in my book I'll land unknown I want to, it's on page 121 it's the it's the chapter is called Poles and I wrote extensively about what I saw, but I didn't really get into it because I was writing from a perspective from what it was like at me at the time. So I'm not going to sit there and go, well, this means this, this, and go off on some tangent. I'm just going to go, this is what happened to me. This is, this, this is how it happened, uh, and, and this is the way it was to me at the time. So I did not go off and give you explanations for everything. So I, I went, I saw this place where these looked like poles, and I could suddenly had discernment. I could see out, and they extended out over the earth. On top of these were sitting these huge, uh, giant uh, entities, and um, they were singing dirges or humming, getting the people to dance to their deception here below. And they would call for these other entities to escape out of the abyss, these demonic creatures who were their minions, so to speak. And at a point in time, they would be able to escape. I can't explain it. And, um, yeah, human beings can't escape these things, but these, you know, you, might, you may not believe that there are portals. But portals are actually mentioned in the Bible, but not by name, okay? You know, you know, Jacob was, a, you know, saw a heavenly portal, he laid his head on a rock in, in Bethel, and he saw this, uh, a ladder and angels descending up and down. It, that is a, called a portal, okay? They, they're, they're real. They're demonic portals. In fact, I can go to the reservation and take you to a couple places and just let you just sit there for a minute. And we have. We've taken people there, and, and it's sort of like um, just to see how in tune they are to the spirit. This is what they say, oh, my arm hurt. I feel sick to my stomach. I got an awful headache. I got to get out of here. You're in traditional medicine grounds for some, some. And uh, portals, demonic portals releasing hell in the land and selling to the people up there that this is paradise. Do the drugs. Do the drinking. Do the abuse. Do, do the sexual exploitation. Do the trafficking. Do this. This is cool. This is the way to be. Get the free money from the government. This is the way to be. And if you try to help them, oh, you're taking our lifestyle away from you. We're, what? We're, you're living in hell. We want to give you life. And, you know, it's your decision. You know, we respect your decision, but, you know. We're going to present the gospel, and you can accept it or not. You can be free of this stuff, a new way to live. You can be an actual human being. You don't want to be subject. Wouldn't it be nice when you're growing up, you weren't passed one parent to one uncle to one person after another? Wouldn't it be nice not to be sexually molested? Wouldn't it be nice not to have to live with a bunch of drunks? Wouldn't it not, you know, nice to be able to trust each other? Wouldn't it be nice? What world do you want to live in? So these entities would come out of these portals and terrorize an area. So that's what I was seeing. <laughs> and I didn't try to explain it. But years later, uh, I, I heard a message about um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. On top of those poles are the principalities and powers. And, and rulers of darkness and host of wickedness in the heavenly places that were conjuring these lower rank minions to do the work to of deception into a large geographic area and they would cause in a geographic location certain things to happen. 
Certain types of crime would be more prevalent in one city than it is in another. That's the things I was seeing. Never got a chance to really talk about that or talk into the book. But I'm just saying, this is what I saw. This is why I'm on, big on spiritual warfare. Now people, um, we, we have this system. And I don't know how else to say it. I'm trying to be nice. We have this system in Christianity in America where uh, I call it the experts. So if you're in an after-death experience, you're only in this one group. You're not allowed out of that box. You're just you're only allowed to talk about that now. If you have a um, a testimony about you know win- witnessing to Christ and saving, you are that, and that is only your niche. You know, there's nothing about you we want to know. They call you a prophet. That's all we want. That's all you're an apostle. apostle have an apostolic call. That's all you are, and we we don't want to know anything else. Boy, the church is being sold out with the knowledge that some folks have about spiritual warfare, dealing with deception, and they don't want to they don't want to hear what you have to say. So and I understand that because it's deception. It's how the world operates, it's how it swings. And so in the thing about poles, I saw that. Though at the time I didn't understand it, but I came back. This this this, this played with my head because I didn't fit. <laughs> you know, I'm a born again new Christian. I didn't fit, but any anywhere really. Then I found a church, was a, and got water baptized there, and it was a nice church. But they only took me so far, and I went to another church. Church of God, Assemblies of God, so forth, etc., and then back to Baptist. So <laughs> those three. So Brian, what are you? I'm I'm a Baptocostal. Primarily Baptist with a lot of Pentecostal in me. People who know me. You know. Tongue talking, devil casting out, you know what? You know, I'm not gonna take lip from the devil. So so what I learned from all this, I'm going to end this with this. I know people want to say, well, I'll explain some of the other things you saw. Maybe in another video, but some of it I can't because it's, it it'd probably get me kicked off here. <laughs> the reason why a lot of it was edited out because the scenes would be too vile. All I can say is your worst nightmare, worst uh, night terror, just imagine what that is. Imagine... The worst horror movie you ever seen, but the person um, never gets out of. But they they die, then they get chopped up again, die, get chopped up again. It's just things like that you saw. Um, and what I did not see, there was no possible way that God was torturing anybody. Who was doing the torturing were the demonic entities acting upon the deception they brought in a person's mind who sold themselves to go there and they were actually providing the room or the mind or their intellect and their cell to torment. It's almost like your worst fears, your worst trepidations coming upon you. Everything you ever done coming back at you and you're getting payback for it. And you don't have a leg to stand on because you know what you really like. And another thing about hell that I didn't adequately explain in my book, and I'll close with this, is that the real you is being exposed. It says in, I think it's Job 25, it says Abaddon, uh, the destroyer, has no covering. In other words, the job is to uncover. And then that explains why the individuals and the entities there wail and travail and they're not asleep they're in pain and anguish it's payback okay hell uncovers your real who you are your sin nature you die in that sin nature you have no you hope you're going to wake up in a worse place than the land of mortar you're going to wake up in hell and you ain't going to get out of it and you're going to have God explain everything. How many times he tried to rescue you? How many times he tried to extend his hand to you? How many times you knocked it out and stuck your finger in the eye and accused God that he better act in equity way or I'm not going to follow him. He's just a mean God who has the Ten Commandments. He doesn't want you to have any fun. Well, what's fun? Letting your little kid get his lower extremities removed? Vasectomies? 
um, hyster hysterectomies and organs cut off because you think it's cool and they think it's cool because you think it's cool and that the world thinks it's cool and then they get older and they say this ain't the way to go yeah right all that's going to be exposed that's why there's hope in Jesus Christ and forgiveness and mercy in Christ who understands all this provided a way back to, to himself how by exposing what we're really like to each other and to God. By the events that happened just before the cross, the 24-hour events for the cross, he was betrayed. He was schemed and, and planned that they would do him in. How many of us did that to people? Betrayed other people. Jesus was abandoned in the garden. How many times have we abandoned people in the garden and we've been abandoned? How many times do we justify bearing false witness, lying, cheating to get ahead? Jesus uh, was whipped and beaten and spat upon. How many people have we done so physically or, 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 or in, a, in a symbolic way? I'm guilty so far of all those. Um, how many people have stolen something? They, they stole the clothes off of Jesus' back and divided them and made cast lots for him. And so Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? And God would answer in the silence of the cross, You divide my garments. You spat on me. You mock me. Look what you do to your brothers and sisters. Look what you do to your family. Look what you do to friends. Look what you do to the world. Look what you do to yourself. Look at the cross. You are a wretch. You bear false witness. You put people down. You lie, you scheme, you abandon, you plot against. You go in front of the governing authorities and, and, are, and you say to God, dance for me, do some miracle that I can believe. If, you, if God would do it my way and love my way, then I would accept him. Well, God is not going to dance for you. He didn't dance for Herod. He ain't going to dance for you. Can't you see the pride and ugliness? I mean, I'm trying to spare you from the pit of hell. This is what was so clear to me when I was judged. This is what I did. And then I come back, and when I started getting back into the Bible and started studying this stuff, I started teaching this right away. And then I didn't know nothing about Romans Road. I didn't uh, have the deep theology where you, you only can do it a certain way. I said, look at the cross. Look at what happened to Jesus before the cross and why he was crucified. We drove the nails in his hands. This is what we do to each other. And we're deceived and by the enchanter, the devil, to think this is a new life to be. Let's slay what is decent and good so we can live depraved and create hell on earth. And we are doing a good job of it, don't you think? And Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now you do. What does Christ require? Fall on your face. And say, Lord Jesus Christ, forgive me. He bled and died, exposing the works of the evil one in your life so to break its power. So you don't have to be a slave anymore. And you can learn what it's like to be a new human being. Is it easy? No. Is there any other way to go? No. This is the only way to go, to be free of it. So if that's you, why don't you just bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a wretch. I see what I've done. Take some time and think about it. You know, just think of what you did. You lied, betrayed, people hurt you, so forth, etc. You have unforgiveness, whatever. Just talk it out with the Lord. Then say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I blew it. Change my life. Take me, I'm yours. Make me born again of your spirit. And lead me the rest of my days. Very simple to pray. Something like that. So when I came back from that place, the other part that was left out of the book that I did not put in there, but it's in my older notes. It's in, in, in the original 40-page draft that was left out. And I left it out myself. And I should have left it in there. And it, it's in my 40-page thing. I left it out of my book, A Land Unknown. This is one last thing that I left out. When Jesus... Um, I stood my feet upon this rock, and he blew on me, and I departed. There was one place he was going to show me, and I didn't understand any of this at the time. 
because I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around what just happened. I was in hell. He came and rescued me. I wept on his shoulder. I did not deserve to come back. I was so grateful. You know, uh, I'm going to follow this, 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 this person the rest of my life. This is the Lord God Almighty. This is Jesus Christ. Uh, he saved me, and I was so grateful. Then he blew on me, and I went backwards, and then I stopped. Part's not in the book. I took it out deliberately. And um, it's in the original draft. It's in the original 40-page um, manuscript that I first wrote. It's called The Outer Darkness. This place, I was suspended between heaven and hell. I couldn't really see heaven, but I could see the, the entrance of hell. And I could see the light. I was on the outer fringes of the light. All I could hear was weeping and such despondent despair and millions of voices. This was, this was, I, I, I go, oh, I just got out. He just rescued me. Am I, this, this, this my lot? This is where I'm going to be the rest of my life? I don't want to be in this outer darkness. And uh, all I can say is in the book of Revelation, I think all those people in the outer darkness are waiting for the white throne judgment to give you an idea of what type of people these are. Why they're in there, I don't know. That wasn't revealed to me. But being there was terrifying. And all of a sudden, I felt Jesus like blowing me again, and boom, I left there and went back to the, into the void, heard the beautiful music, and uh, talked about the glories and the uh, revelation of the Lord God Almighty and all his character traits, and wow, it just mesmerized me. Anyway, it still does. <laughs> and so we um, I just kind of floated back into my body, then the rest is history. I was taken to the hospital, and that's all in the book. But that's the last part I did not put in the book, and I should have, but I didn't. I don't know why I took it out. I couldn't even answer that. Um, <laughs> I was tired of writing. I don't know. I just... just didn't want to put that in there. So, but that outer darkness was absolutely frightening. So hope you learned something and you like this video. If you like it, share it, like it, hit the button. Hallelujah. Please do, please do. If you like, share the video, like it. Um, comment in the comment section, you know, if I do respond to you, I don't mean to come across, if you, if you disagree with what I'm saying, I don't mean to come across in a harsh way. I'm only trying to make people think because, you know, I've got a lot of compassion for people. Um, but I'm also with a criminal justice background. I worked in criminal justice. And so I'm very direct. I can be very confrontational because I was trained in confrontational therapy to, uh, for, for hardened violent criminal types. I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with narcissists. I'm dealing with psychopaths incarcerated in halfway houses in a different world. <laughs> and I, I'm trying, after all these years of being out of the field, I'm still trying to adjust from that. But I'm not trying to be harsh or, or, any, or mean to anyone, okay? But anyway, I'll look at a few comments and uh, we'll go from there. Hope you enjoyed this video. <laughs> it was ad hoc. I am going to post my new video probably within the end of the day. Okay. I think you'll enjoy that one. You guys be blessed. But in Jesus name, for those of you who want to watch on, I'm going to take a few questions. God bless. Also, if you want to contact me, everything like that, if you want to contact me, my contact information's there. Now, I do not know what I'll do with the PayPal because of what's going on. So just right, right now, everything is update, all my contact information, email addresses, everything, and my book is up there on the screen. And be sure to help support what I do if you believe in what I do and keep me on the air. And um, God bless you all.